Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully folks are still kind of figuring out how to register and get their audio working, uh, but we'll kind of get started with some introductions, uh, introductory comments uh, before we really roll into the meat of it. Uh, good evening, my name is Laura Aldrete. I am the Executive Director of Community Planning and Development. Uh, and I just wanna thank you all for coming this evening. Um, as we start, you know, I the um, image here, the skyline photo, uh, I was gonna start with this nice quaint story about coming downtown uh, as a child to uh, meet my grandmother who worked at the Made in F uh, in the lingerie section, oddly. Um, and uh, when it was at 16th and um, Court uh, and to go ice skating when uh, the ice skating rink was down there. Uh, but as I look at the skyline, right, and look at how much the thing that's changed to me as I look at this picture is uh, the Lodo area. And that reminds me more of my high school days um, down kind of by where that crane is now uh, and uh, going clubbing at Rock Island. And uh, uh, hanging out a little bit under the viaducts of 16th Street uh, or 15th Street. So um, maybe some of you might have shared some of those experiences, or maybe I saw you clubbing there. Um, but, um, you know, what strikes me about the skyline photo is how uh, different it is from today and, and 20, you know, 30, probably 35 years ago is what that was. Um, it, it's a vast, vastly different photo. I do believe, though, that great cities like Denver evolve and change, and that's what keeps their vibrancy. Uh, if I think about cities like Mexico City or Rome, um, I think about that evolution of cities. So, so we are like that, right? For the last 150 years or 70 years that we've been around um, since Denver was settled, we have changed. We have grown. It has been a city of opportunity. Um, and so as residents and business owners, policymakers, we're tasked really with shaping that growth uh, in a way that aligns with our community values. And, um, you know, 25 years ago, it was just about bringing residents to, um, to the downtown because it was a central, strictly a central business district. Um, we have achieved that goal. And today we talk about the range of housing. So we talk about how do we bring affordable housing to all neighborhoods and all communities in Denver. So um, we evolve and change as we should, uh, as our city does. Um, and our thinking has changed fortunately as well. So uh, again, I just wanna thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, these, this, is, this is an important conversation uh, for all of us to have. Um, I'm excited that we've got a really broad uh, audience this evening to engage in the topics tonight. Um, and um, we can, uh, just moving to the next slide. Thanks all, let me just run through the topics for tonight. Um, you're gonna hear about two topics that are uh, extremely important to me, uh, as well as the city and to community planning and development. And those are climate action and equitable development. So uh, just a couple comments on that. You know, we're, we are really uh, a leader in sustainability. We're the only city in North America to be re recognized by National Geographic as a sus sustainable destination in 2021. Um, and we're also only one of 88 cities uh, that worldwide to be recognized for continuing to lead on environmental action despite the pressures of, rec of uh, responding to COVID-19. So those are remarkable um, notations that globally Denver has received and I think pushing that on, continuing to push that envelope is incredibly important to us. Um, and we're also though uh, focused on achieving more equitable development outcomes for communities. And I strongly believe that these are not, these are, um, can be mutually inclusive. Uh, these two elements were at a point in our history where policies that advance equity, inclusivity, and health are so important. Uh, and CPD is really working towards these goals uh, in all of our work from neighborhood planning to, to the review and permitting of uh, large developments, which we'll also hear about. 
this evening. Um, and while we won't touch on it uh, this evening, uh, I would be remiss if I don't point out uh, that great design matters. Uh, and this is a topic that you can expect to hear much more from, from CPD in particular uh, over the coming year uh, as another focus point. So to start tonight off, we'll have a brief presentation by Scott Prisco, who's our uh, amazing Den uh, building official for the city of Denver. And he'll discuss some of the recent changes in the world of development permitting. Uh, and then we'll also come back to a panel conversation tonight to discuss progress on uh, climate action, as well as equitable development impacts towards development and construction. And then we'll open it up uh, for some Q&A. So how do you participate? Um, so one of the most important things is for us to listen and really hear from our customers and our community. Uh, so there's a couple uh, venues is you can ask questions in the chat at any time. Uh, there are a number of city staff uh, from a variety of departments, including forestry, Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, uh, Denver Water and Excel have joined us as well. Uh, to um, be who will be looking for those questions and to be able to answer them in real time. If we don't respond, we will, there will be follow up um, as well. So, and then if you'd like to answer or ask a question live to any of our panelists, just use the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. This will put you in the queue and then when it's your turn, we'll um, ask you to unmute yourself uh, to ask your question. So from here, I'll turn it over to Scott to talk about um, development uh, and permitting. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, really excited to be uh, here tonight. I, I've, been, I've been in this position a little bit over five years now in Denver, and um, we've, we've had this uh, since I've been here. And uh, I, I can unequivocally say this is our best attended uh, uh, event, have, having um, all of you here tonight. We, we greatly appreciate it. I want to thank Amanda Weston, who's done an amazing job in putting this together. Great work, Amanda. And I, uh, the development community that's here with us tonight, you know, a big thank you and kudos to you. I know this has uh, been deemed an essential uh, uh, industry in this pandemic, and, and you guys are, are doing a great job. I know we're, we've had unprecedented logs uh, this year over last year, and our plan review team is doing great. I want to thank them, and I want to thank our, our inspection team for going out there day in and day out, helping you get through your projects. So it's it's been a team effort, and I just wanted to thank uh, all of you in the audience today, both uh, uh, CPD employees and, and, and all city and county employees and the development community. So thank you for participating in this event today. Uh, as you know, uh, we, we've really ramped up our e-permitting, uh, especially uh, with the pandemic. So everything you do now, just about everything, is, is through our electronic format. Uh, and um, we've really worked hard to make it more interactive. Uh, so whether you're doing plan review or you're getting a permit or you're, you're looking uh, to schedule an inspection or see what time that inspection is, that's all available through our denvergov.org backslash ePermits portal. And so everything can be found there. We have some great video tutorials and some FAQs and, and there's step-by-step -step tutorials if you haven't used our system to before. Again, whether you're pulling a permit or you want to add a contractor to a permit or pay for a permit, there are tutorials and it, it's easy. It's really easy step-by-step. Step. I'd recommend it. Um, with these presentations, we usually like to point out uh, where contractors uh, or developers are making mistakes through our system and we want to make sure that we get that out there so it's a better process for you. Um, one of the biggest ones we're finding uh, are the subcontractors are pulling uh, both a quick permit and then getting told, hey, that's the wrong permit, and then having to pull another permit. Uh, as you know, if, if you're the G, a GC out there, I know we have a lot of GCs uh, on this presentation, um, you usually get that email that looks somewhat like this screen where it says, hey, your ComCon 2934 is ready to go. Uh, you can pay for that now. And then it, it lists your, your other trade permits. Uh, you have the option to either add them uh, to that permit and pay for it. So you can add your contractor to that and pull the right permit for that trade because we're giving you the permit number there. Or you can just forward that email that you've received to your subcontractor. But it really is helpful if you could pull the correct permit uh, for that. And if you have any questions, you can always go to plan review at denvergov.org and they will get back to you hopefully within 24 hours. That's our goal uh, uh, for that. And, and we do think um, 
uh, this will help you if you pull the right permit. Because I know when you go to get your TCO and CO when it's really stressful, if you have open permits, you gotta close them. And you wouldn't have been calling permits against the one that you opened incorrectly. So we strongly recommend that you, you go through this process correctly. Um, we're always trying to improve. Continual improvement is really uh, first and foremost on all of our minds. Uh, some of the big things that we're moving forward this year on are commercial uh, uh, permits, both quick permits and some of our other permits that aren't there quite yet. They'll all be moving towards uh, a digital format. We're really excited about that. We have some other permits that will go online uh, digitally. Um, one of the biggest things that we've been working on, it's, it's taken most of this year for this initiative because it involves just about every agency that you touch with a permit, is, is transferring that, that card that we've all used for, for the past 25 years, that same uh, yellow card that we have to get the red box signatures to get your CO, TCO uh, at the end of the day, we're moving that to, to a digital format so that you don't have to bring, physically bring that, that card uh, to your inspector to get signed. They will sign it digitally. Uh, we're hopeful that we are uh, weeks away from unrolling this. We're really excited about it. It's a huge customer win for us. Uh, and so we're really optimistic about that. And we're, we're unrolling some new, new, uh, a new look to our permits coming up in the first quarter, hopefully, uh, where um, it will really help uh, you, the GCs and the superintendents for each trade really understand the criteria. Our, our codes are changing. And it's really important that we highlight those important components on the permit for the, uh, the each, each trade. And then that allows our inspectors to inspect against those important things as well. As we, uh, as we look at some of the other improvements that we made, uh, the large development review uh, really replaced our general development plan process about a year and a half ago. Uh, and I, I really want to compliment, uh, the mayor put together uh, the Economic Recovery uh, Committee, uh, and they work really hard. And, and, and Chris Gleisner, uh, in the site development manager for the site development team, has really, really made some, some great strides on this. And you're going to see a lot of, of, of great improvements on this process moving forward. And this, these are the projects, those five acres or more, so over three city blocks, has major uh, infrastructure improvements required, so those big projects. But you're going to you're gonna see some really big improvements here and we're very excited about this, very excited. Another big thing we've done, um, we, I've, since I've been here, there's a lot of contractors that do those smaller projects, maybe 7-Elevens, strip malls, low rise sort of commercial buildings are transitioning from doing some commercial work in other communities, trying to do it here in Denver. And there's a big hurdle to get from that B license like from a residential to a B license. It's, it's a big leap because it could be a B encompasses six, seven story buildings under 75 feet, elevators, complex footings, foundations. It's hard to get that license. And you might only be out there looking to try and get uh, a license for those smaller, maybe one or two story commercial buildings. We've made that process easier now and we're gonna be rolling out this B2 uh, license, which is, which is really great. I, th I think this is gonna be a big help uh, to uh, uh, those smaller contractors. And, and a lot of them are, are, are smaller minority owned companies. And I, I think this will be a lot easier for you to, to obtain your licensing. So we're really excited about this opportunity. Uh, we have some commercial uh, zoning updates. Uh, this, this is really good. I think there's a few, few big wins here. Uh, it's really gonna help. We realize that our zoning code is, is, is complicated at times, right? It's, it's, it's a big thick book and, and there are sections that are, are tough to meander through. So we're gonna have an opportunity for you to meet with our team ahead of submittal. And uh, it will be, uh, hopefully we're, we're shooting for like a three day window. So if you shoot an email over and say, hey, I want a pre-application meeting, we're looking at maybe a three day window uh, to get that virtual meeting uh, 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 planned out so that you can make sure that your submittal will happen in the right, in the right format and in the right manner. Uh, another big win uh, is we're trying to pull out some of those quicker, faster projects. And instead of bundling everything into a two or three week, week review period, if we, can, if we can pull some of those quick reviews out as a three day review, I think that's gonna, that's gonna actually help some of our other projects get done quicker and facilitate for these simple things a much faster uh, process for you. So we're, we're thinking this will be a big customer win as well. Uh, we have some great opportunities for uh, 
for training. Uh, we realize we're making uh, a lot of changes uh, in short periods of time to, to help everybody out. And uh, as you saw with the green building ordinance, we had some great training there. I know Tina Axelrad had some great zoning training that we had filmed. Uh, and and we're, there, there's opportunities uh, for this training uh, uh, coming up. I know the landmark team is really good at this. Every year they have these trainings. And if you're even thinking about doing a landmark project, or, or the project you're working on currently is about to start. These are really some great trainings that, that I would recommend. It talks about the designation process. A lot of times there are issues with window replacements and, and, and things like that. Uh, the tax credits are always complicated. I, I'd highly recommend if you're even thinking about a, a landmark preservation project to, to take a look at this uh, uh, webinar series. It's, it will definitely be time well spent. With our IECC projects, the, the new code, is, it's really getting complicated. I think everyone realizes. And as we pro progress through our code adoption processes, the IECC is going to be the most complicated moving forward. And to make this easier, uh, in de on December 1st, we launched sort of a new checklist to help, help folks uh, um, meander through that, both on commercial and residential projects. And we have a training for these. And then in January, we're going to make that, that checklist a mandatory submittal with larger projects, commercial projects, tenant fit up projects over 10,000 square feet, single family and duplex projects. And I know this sounds like we're from the government and we're, we're here to help kind of thing, right? You're going you're gonna to do this, but we really are. We think this is going to be a big win for the architects and engineers because it's not only going to help your team, your design team, facilitate our, our process and, and the complexity of the code, but it's actually gonna facilitate a quicker review with hopefully, hopefully less cycles. So you'll get through our process much quicker. So we think this is gonna be a big win for, for both us and for the, the development community. Uh, one of the exciting things that happened in our last uh, 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 code cycle was the uh, uh, development of the Denver Green Code. Oh, there goes the lights. We didn't, we didn't pay the electric bill again. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's six o'clock. They, they, they shut up to remind us to leave. Um, so uh, thank you for that little interruption. So we have some great work that our, our communications team, Laura Schwartz and her team is, is uh, uh, getting through uh, a new uh, look that'll be more intuitive for our website. We're very excited about that. And I'd recommend, we have over 2,500 folks already signed up for newsletters and other notices. Here are some links that you can get to for those notices, uh, information uh, to, to, to keep well informed on when we make changes and policy updates. So I'd highly recommend uh, looking at those. Um, again, the, the Denver Green Code is, is something we're very excited about. Uh, we do have another code adoption process coming up in 2021. It will start soon. We're going to want public input at the beginning of the year on some of the more complicated uh, energy code pieces. So if you're interested in getting involved, please contact us. We have, we have availability on, on both the code seats, that, uh, the voting seats, and uh, we're looking for input on the green code and energy code uh, uh, actual, actual uh, submittals for suggested uh, amendments moving forward. So if you want to take an active role in that, there are opportunities uh, both to be on the, the code uh, uh, groups that are the voting uh, committees and also on uh, creating some, some new code amendments. Now we're, we're doing some really great things. In, in 2018 in Denver, uh, you know, the mayor initiated the 80 by 50 plan, which essentially you're, we're, we're, we're committing to, uh, you know, an 80% reduction by 2050 uh, using 2005 as a, as a, as a base, uh, uh, a benchmark uh, year. And then uh, also shooting for the 2035 goal, net zero energy new buildings. And I, I will say that the climate action team, uh, the, the public process in 2020 is actually wanting to advance this to like an 80 by 40 plan where you have 100% reduction by 2040 and instead of 2035 for the net zero go to 2030. So, and this is, this is community driven. It's really exciting to see. This is just, just fantastic to see and be part of a process uh, that is so progressive. I, we are one of the cutting edge cities in the United States at this point in terms of climate action and it's exciting to be part of that. Uh, our Denver Green Code is, is helping facilitate that. And it, right now, our current version of this, it's voluntary. It's, it's completely optional. 
uh, um, we have a pilot program that I'll go over in a moment. Uh, and, and this includes sort of a, if you're familiar with the USGBC, the lead, it's more of a holistic approach. We're looking at uh, reusable, recycled content, uh, uh, water quality management on the site, uh, low use water fixtures, uh, uh, energy efficiency, uh, management plans after the buildings uh, uh, occupied. So there's, there's, there's a lot of similarity in terms of if, if, if you've done a lead project, uh, it follows a lot of that format. Uh, we have a couple options to get through this. One, you can follow our green code, which chapter by chapter sort of goes through water, uh, uh, you know, water conservation and energy conservation and all the different chapters. That's one way. Or you could just, if you're going to be lead platinum, you could just show us your lead platinum worksheet and at the end of the day, you're, you're, when we're going through the inspection process, uh, your commissioning report and how you're, you're managing the lead uh, and where you are with that. Another option is just be net zero energy. And then net zero energy, our definition is all electric, no gas allowed in the net zero. And in terms of the fourth option, it's a little bit more complicated, but some folks are familiar with the passive house uh, form of construction. If you follow that path, you, you don't have to do the energy chapters, but you have to do everything else. Uh, so those are the, the ways to do it. If you if you were looking for the very easiest way to do it, more complicated in terms of learning a new code, but the easiest path forward, that would be to just follow the Denver Green Code chapter by chapter. And so the pilot program, what we did was we initiated, uh, there's two parts of this. There's five projects that are affordable housing projects and HOST has already identified those five projects. We're already working towards those during their concept plan. We're looking for five more projects uh, in uh, it, to, to enter into this. We have one that is already signed up. Uh, so we have four slots available. And, and what does it mean to be part of the pilot program and why are we doing this? So the, the pilot program is about expediting your process, both in the site development plan process and in the, and in the permitting process. Permitting is a little bit easier. We'll just, if it's a four week initial review and a two week resubmittal, we'll just cut that in half to two weeks and one week. Uh, and there'll be a fee reduction of uh, 50, up to $50,000 fee reduction uh, at, which will be uh, reduced at when you go to pick up your permit. And, and that's there to help augment some of the costs that we realize that will happen uh, doing a more sustainable design. And we're hoping that this time savings uh, and the carrying costs saved will also help offset some of those costs so that, that, that your, your return on investment for that, the ROI on, on going for a sustainable design will be there. And, and the idea for the pilot is to get some development teams used to using our our Denver Green Code, because as you as we unroll the next code cycle, we're going to take some of that low hanging fruit in our Denver Green Code. So some of the easy things in each chapter, we're going to say, hey, that's mandatory now, and then make a more more robust uh, 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 sort of stretch code, this optional code, uh, and main and continue that stretch code. And then in future code cycles, more and more will be added to the main base code. And it's at some point the Denver Green Code, maybe sooner than later, will all become base code. And, and that's what we're really excited about this. The, the future, I mean, this is, this is our pathway to get to the, the goals that we talked about, those very aspirational goals that Denver has in terms of net zero and, and the reducing the greenhouse gases. This is where uh, we're, we're really gonna make a difference. And that, that's where, uh, why we're trying to get folks to understand and learn the green code. So now we're at the point uh, where we're going we're gonna, to uh, start our, our panelists. And I, I'd really like to introduce our panelists. We have some of the top leaders here with us today uh, in the leadership team uh, within the city and county of Denver. And Laura Eldredi has been here for a little bit over a year in the, in the community planning and development team. She's picked up the ball and ran with it and just, just I mean, without missing a beat, just been phenomenal. Uh, and Grace Rink coming from Chicago uh, in, a, in a brand new sort of agency that, that's set up by the mayor. It's just, she's really, really made a big difference in a short period of time of being the executive director of that program. And, and Irene Aguilar uh, being the director of the Neighborhood Equity uh, and Stabilization uh, uh, Group within the Department of Economic uh, uh, Development and Opportunity has done some amazing work as well. And I, I think this is a great opportunity for the development community to have a dialogue with this top leadership in Denver. Uh, and, and with that, I'd like to, to start the first question. Uh, it'll, it'll go to, to Grace and Laura. And, and in any city, climate action is, is, is really important. And as we know, Denver, we're, we're really at the forefront here. And you know, through 
the green building ordinance that was a, a community driven referendum we, we just recently in november we passed the the, the sales tax to, to push forward climate uh, goals uh, it's really amazing and and and, and grace we'll start with you if i was to say what it, the Denver Building and Fire Codes and our amendments, how, how does that all play a role in this? How do you see it uh, moving, advancing the needle? Well, first, thank you so much for having me. And what a tremendous audience we have this evening. Thanks to all of you for spending some of your time with us tonight. So Scott, you gave a really good overview of the 80 by 50 plan, which is officially uh, Denver's um, greenhouse gas emissions reduction goal. So it still is currently that our, it's our goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050 over the 2005 baseline. And I'm very pleased to report that we actually hit our first target, which was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 20% by 2020. So we've already hit that goal. We hit that um, according to 2019 data. So we might even be a little bit ahead of the game. Now, Laura's the, you're, Ashok, you're the code expert, so I'm not gonna speak directly to the code, um, but I'll, so I'll focus our response on how our office is engaged you know, the goal, that 80 by 50 goal, and then the other goal that you referenced, which was by the Climate Action Task Force, which was a group of uh, residents and, and representatives of different institutions here in town, um, they have recommended a more aggressive goal, which would be to reduce uh, emissions by 100% by 2040. Neither of these goals, whether we, achieve, whether we adopt the more aggressive goal or stay with the goal we have, neither of these can be achieved without uh, dramatically reducing or frankly, eventually eliminating the emissions generated by our buildings and homes. And so our office, very small, it's the, called the Office of Climate Action, Sustainability and Resiliency. Right now we're a team of 12, and probably in the next year we hope to grow to 20, thanks to um, those of you who voted for the 2A ballot initiative, which created the Climate Protection Fund. Um, so we will be able to grow in capacity, uh, but still we are the policy, we may be policy experts, but we're not the boots on the ground, right? Community planning and development, they're the boots on the ground. Your shop writes the code and enforces the code. You're the ones who are in direct communication with the development community. But I'm pleased to report to everybody here that we are partnering together really closely now that we're an existing office. We actually just um, became an office in July of this year. One of the first projects we're working on together in collaboration with CPD is actually creating a series of professional development opportunities for the design and construction industry and for um, developers as well to learn more about the Denver Green Code um, and, and to learn how to begin incorporating it into uh, projects at every phase of design and through construction. Um, we are also, our office, a lot of what we do is we, we may be pushing policy, but way, the way we like to look at it is we're trying to help move the market. And the, the shadow goal, which doesn't get talked about too much, is that if we're successful in the policies that we're able to create that um, bring more net, that bring net zero into um, you know, the common parlance of buildings here in Denver, is that it will create new jobs. It creates new jobs, it sustains existing jobs, and not just any jobs, right? And I'm speaking to the contractors who are out there. Um, these are good paying trades jobs that don't get outsourced right, that only continue to be in high demand. And we're really excited about that. So while we obviously, our office has the very obvious um, goal of reducing emissions and, you know, and advancing smart design, there's this other goal that I think is a citywide goal. And that is really sustaining the employment market um, within our building and trades industry. So I probably would leave it there so that we can get to Laura to talk some more specifically about the code. But I think the important thing to know is that our two offices really work in partnership together. Um, we would never want to come out with a policy that the planning office says is simply not possible and isn't, isn't forwarding, isn't advancing Denver's goals. And we think that by working in partnership together, we can achieve it. That sounds, that sounds great. Yeah, we, we don't want to make unrealistic things that, uh, right? We don't want to put codes that, that really wouldn't work. So I agree with that. Um, yeah. And yeah, so, and I just would echo that as well. Uh, it's been delightful having Grace come onto the team and really build her, you know, uh, build the team, but also build the relationship uh, across, you know, all the various work groups within CPD. So uh, just, again, another warm Denver welcome to you, Grace, although I feel like you're 
you're kind of local now at this point. Uh, so, so just to touch a little bit on the Denver Green Code and our energy codes, you know, we have, we're on um, one of the first U.S. cities to begin implementing a green construction code and our energy codes are among the top in the nation as well. So we should um, hold our head up high on that. And also um, it also sets a bar, a high bar for us to continue down that path, uh, in particular on Denver Green Code. Right, right now it's a, a voluntary code we implemented for the first time this year. And as Scott talked earlier about the um, pilot program, uh, and gave a great overview of, the, uh, of that code specifically uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, but I also want to emphasize is how we're using uh, this time now to really test out the provisions of the code, uh, both for the applicant as well as for us to understand what works and what doesn't, um, where we need to refine. So part of this will be to identify those pieces in the Denver Green Code um, to become part of our base, the mandatory code with each code cycle moving forward. Uh, so it's an iterative process. Uh, it's not revolutionary. It's taking it in pieces and um, understanding what pieces to move forward through the conversations uh, and the testing that we do with the construction and development industry. Uh, we're working towards uh, drastic reductions in greenhouse gas, um, gas emissions across our city. And so you can expect to see our codes to continue to evolve to accomplish those goals, in particular as it relates to the Denver Green Code. Now, uh, um, specific to the energy code, you know, I would say that we're continually strengthening our energy codes to stay at that forefront of energy con conservation nationally as I mentioned earlier, and um, to achieve the targets for net zero energy and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we adopted the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code last year, and next year we'll start working towards adopting um, the 2021 Energy Code. So we, we uh, are firm believers in, in staying current um, and continuing to push the, um, push the bar on achieving those energy code um, standards. So forward thinking about, um, it's really about forward thinking about what makes sense for Denver. So for example, electric vehicle charging requirements uh, for commercial multifamily properties um, were added to the code in the last uh, co uh, code adoption. Uh, so, um, but again, just to reiterate, this is really a partnership uh, with you all and re continuing to reach out and have those conversations about getting your thoughts and feedback on the 2021 code and the proposed local uh, amendment. So look forward to um, hearing from us. And if you don't hear from us, you know, reach out to us to get engaged. All right, great. So, so thank talking about forward thinking. I mean, one of the forward thinking uh, components uh, that recently happened in Denver a few years ago that, that, that again, voter initiated referendum, the green building ordinance uh, came about. It was originally uh, taken from uh, a, a Canadian ordinance and it, it wasn't really set for Denver. And, and so the, the climate uh, action uh, team worked with the community and developed uh, over about a nine month period and then ultimately adopted by council this this new green building ordinance, which is a, a phenomenal ordinance. I think it's an ordinance that could be a model for many U.S. cities as a very progressive way because it, it, it impacts uh, roof replacement, which is a constant maintenance and a way to, to enhance upgrades in, in existing buildings that might not otherwise get there, helps reduce heat island effect. And, and so there's some really great components and, and the way it was, it was trans, transpired, this new version of this green building ordinance uh, gives a lot of options for building owners both in existing buildings and new buildings so it's it's really a, a, a great thing uh, Laura we'll start with you what what are what are your thoughts in terms of what's transpired where do you see this this like moving forward what, what do you think about this yeah um, thanks Scott so so I think one of the uh, first things I think about uh, one of the maybe the the best one of the best lessons learned about the green roofs initiative is the intent was spot on. Um, what we learned was context is everything. So whether it's um, geography, where you are in the world, um, the fact that we're a semi-arid desert, right? We struggle with green roofs to actually implement that um, in, in um, 
in a way that Chicago um, knocks it out of the park. And so um, that that was a, a that was a part of that nine months learning uh, discussion of what work what's really if we stay with the intent what really works for Denver. Uh, and so with this, you know, with the Denver voters voting for the green roofs uh, be to become mandatory on all new buildings in 2017, we worked um, with folks who were for it and against it uh, uh, to really understand um, the uh, a much more holistic uh, set of alternatives that allow for the design and cost flexibility um, still achieving the environmental benefits. And as I said, like also layering in, like, let's recognize, you know, that we're a mile high in the semi-arid desert um, in the middle of the country. And that's a different animal than Canada or Chicago or other places that are doing green roofs. Um, but everyone agreed on the intent, right? I think even people who um, struggled with it still understood that we've got to push the, the bar forward. Uh, so in the end, you know, the end result was it, what has now called the Green Building Ordinance, uh, which lets projects pick some pick among a, a number of options, like installing uh, installing solar panels, adding green space on the ground plane or on the roof, um, achieving LEED certification. And there's several other choices as well. So. You know, last spring we um, completed an annual review of the program's first year. And I'll say in general, I think just it, one of the um, things that the city of Denver has taken on, and in particular, I would say uh, community planning and development is we integrate metrics and making sure we're measuring. So when we set our goals on our policies, we are much better about integrating metrics and saying, let's let's test ourselves and see how we're doing. And so we can course correct along the way. So as a part of that, um, we have done that with, with uh, the green building ordinance now. The first full year of implementation, we've got about 65 permitted projects completed uh, through the process. Uh, the most frequently selected option is uh, involving uh, use of less uh, energy, which will have the, you know, obviously a positive impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And then um, in reducing those emissions in buildings and homes, we're really getting at um, trying to bring down uh, issues such as uh, urban heat island effect. Uh, buildings and homes in Denver currently comprise 63% of Denver's greenhouse gas emissions, um, which we often don't think about um, the physical form contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. We also often think about cars or other uh, um, other contributors, but um, and that's that's very significant. Um, so and by 2050, with this uh, ordinance, 40% of all buildings and homes will be new, so that we will be able to apply the green building ordinance to them uh, to to begin offsetting that. So all these projects have a cool roof, uh, which is um, again goes towards reducing that urban heat island effect. Um, except for there's one uh, in Denver that is pretty iconic uh, that uh, is not applied that that uh, it's white you might know which one it is uh, but it doesn't um, have to uh, it's already a cool roof I guess both literally and uh, figuratively for the for the purpose of the, the uh, green building ordinance it's the airport great um, you know one one interesting fact is if you if you do the Denver green code uh, you already comply with the um, green building ordinance, so you don't have to worry about that sort of review uh, to get your project through the through the process. So that's interesting little component if you decide to use the green code. Um, try yep. to put a little plug in there for the pilot program. Get more participants. Feel free to email me if you if you want to try that pilot program. So Grace, what do you think your department? Uh, uh, is, is going to see moving forward with the green building uh, ordinance and, and do you have any other thoughts around that ordinance? Sure, and um, I know I've actually been told I need to keep it a little bit tight so we can um, get on to the rest of the presentation. So I think I've got three key points that I will make building off of what Laura said. First, um, she mentioned the deliberative process of working with stakeholders to inform our uh, policy and code development process and that works and we're going to continue to use that. So one of the, um, one of the new uh, in initiatives that we're launching in 2021 
is a, a stakeholder engagement process to help us develop a building performance policy that's for existing buildings. And it really builds off of lessons learned from the green building ordinance. And um, one of the thing, uh, one of the other points I'd make building off of that is that options work, right? Giving designers and building owners and developers options for how they can meet the intent of a code really seems to work because like Laura said, you know, the location matters, the building type matters. Um, and we really, we want, we don't want to be difficult. We want this to work for everybody to achieve our goals, but also allow people to build and own the buildings that they want. Um, and then finally, I think that with the statistics that we're seeing coming out of the green building ordinance, it's clear that building owners and designers are on board with energy efficiency. And so I think that's really promising for us. Um, again, you know, going back to your point about the um, 65%, almost 65% of Denver voters voted in favor of 2A, so we know we have our community support, and that really matters. And so I think that all of us combined, we know that we can um, get to a point where we've got the buildings and the codes and the um, development process really aligned um, to, our, to meet all of our goals. That's great, really great, um, great comments. Um, I'd like to shift gears now to uh, another really, really important topic for Denver, another priority, which is um, equitable development. And, and Irene, I'd, I'd like to start with you on this one. And it, you know, maybe it's a two part question. Um, what, what do you see the, the, you know, your department nest, uh, what, what, what do you see as your role in this sort of development process? And, and what are you seeing uh, when you're out there talking to the neighborhoods? Uh, what are they saying about design? What are they saying about the type of projects that are happening, about, about uh, sustainability? Uh, are there concerns that you're, you're hearing from neighborhoods? Uh, you know, we have a big development community here with us today. What, what are you hearing when you're, when you're out there in these neighborhoods? Thank you for the question and thank you for this webinar opportunity. So Nest was created in 2018 to um, deal, to help um, keep people from being displaced by gentrification. We've enjoyed as a city seeing a lot of revitalization. Unfortunately, oftentimes the revitalization um, leads to increase in prices for some people and increases their risk for displacement. And so uh, we focus actually on trying to help raise up the voice of the local community and allow them to have a say in what comes into their community and what they'd like to see. I think uh, the biggest fear we hear is that they won't be able to afford to stay in Denver. As you know, there is an educational gap between people who are born in Denver and people who are imported into Denver. And so one of the things NEST tries to focus on is bridging the um, economic equity gap by providing more opportunities for education and training through nonprofit organizations and by working with DITO's workforce development program to help get people into higher paying jobs. Um, in terms of the build itself, I think most of the time people are just concerned to be sure that there is a space for them in the design, whether it be through working or through living opportunities. All right, great, great. That's that's great information, um, Laura. What what are your thoughts on um, uh, on NAST, and what do what do you have in terms of uh, advice or or thoughts for the development community uh, as they're planning their projects moving forward? You're on mute, uh, Laura. I do that all the time. Um, I didn't. I hopefully you didn't see the cuss word come out of my mouth. Um, so, so anyways, I was just gonna say, you know, Irene is spot on, right? The, this is um, a critical moment uh, for sure for our city and I believe for our nation where we are, um, the implications of providing um, an equitable city uh, will send, the, will, will dictate the trajectory of whether, what our city looks like um, over the next 50 years, maybe over the next 20 even. Um, and in particular for community planning development, um, you know, the practice that we are in um, as we define cities and the tools that we use to define cities and, and just not just Denver, but across the country, um, we carry a history of laws and regulations written to intentionally segregate communities um, and they have a lasting impact 
uh, if anyone's interested in understanding that better, um, there's a terrific book I just finished that was written a couple of years ago called The Color of Law. And I would highly encourage, it's a hard book, um, especially, you know, because it's very, it's targeted specifically at um, planning and development, but it's a really important book to understand the basis upon which the work we do today. Um, but, you know, one of the fund fundamental elements um, of our comp plan, um, and so this conversation about equity has been bubbling up. Um, obviously, we saw it come to a head this summer, I think, uh, but, you know, we, it was already part of the conversations through Denver Comprehensive Plan and Blueprint Denver that, um, you know, I would say 16, 17, and 18, or 17, 18, and 19, uh, we worked with the community to develop, passed in 2019, um, we, one of those fundamental elements is to be an inclusive city. Uh, in addition, um, land use and transportation plan, which is Blueprint Denver, um, that was also adopted at the same time, um, is the first citywide land use plan in Denver to account for socioeconomic factors. And in fact, in that plan, and in Comp Plan Denver uh, 2040, we, we, you know, going back to the metrics thing um, point earlier, we are measuring ourselves every year to see what are, you know, what are our impacts on displacement and are we working, is the work that we're doing as a city and as a community planning development, is, are, is it measuring, is it mattering, is it affecting communities that are typically, you know, historically underserved? Um, so, uh, we, we, this is a real issue that um, if it doesn't touch you, uh, if you don't think it touches you, it probably touches you um, in ways that you haven't thought about, whether it's who provides your, helps provide your groceries or clean your house or, um, you know, r drive your, the buses. Um, these are folks that um, are continuing to get pinched out of our city. And so um, we need to address that uh, to, to, in order to have a complete city. So a couple of things I would suggest uh, to, to get back to your question is, you know, you're not, not every project um, requires a community meeting, but um, to my point earlier about context, um, historical and cultural context uh, and neighborhood context is just as important as the geography of the place that we're in. And so understanding the place that you are coming into, the community that you're coming into um, is incredibly important and will make a uh, major, can really impact the look and feel and design of your, uh, of your project, um, as well as build bridges with what are the needs and um, you know, desires of the community? And can those be incorporated into your design and really begin building a long-term relationship? Because those, the people in those communities and our communities um, will be there for a long time and your project wants to be a part of that community. And I think they, I think communities want those projects to be a part of their community and reflect their community. Um, so, that, that engagement means you've got to listen, um, and, and that's something we are always working on. I think we can, all, you know, everybody, whether it's in our personal lives or in our professional lives, listening, uh, being better listeners, uh, and um, understanding people from the, meeting people where they are is really important. So I would encourage that as a part of that community engagement. Uh, and, um, so I think, you know, I touched on this a little bit, but just thinking differently about the landscape um, that we're operating in. And I, I don't mean the, the plants, I mean, um, it's kind of back to the point about cultural context and, and the history of neighborhoods uh, in particular. Um, so uh, just while other, um, just a little bit more detail on the work that impacts resident developments, um, while you know state law prevents us from regulating how affordable housing how many affordable housing units um, and at what uh, area meeting incomes they're at uh, levels they're at that are sufficient for a project we do strongly um, offer guidance uh, that also you know that um, responds to the neighborhood needs. And so in Blueprint Denver, we have done analyses to understand what some of those needs are and identifying 
what neighborhoods are um, have been identified for vulnerability to displacement. So those can be really helpful so you can have a better understanding just from a data demographic standpoint. Uh, I want to uh, just also reemphasize re Irene's point about the current linkage fee is really not, um, hasn't hit the mark uh, to be enough to provide funding for creating and maintaining deed restricted housing, which is what we call affordable housing. Um, we have a project underway now to identify zoning tools that can help encourage more affordable and mixed income housing in areas near public transportation. So not just TOD stations or transit oriented development stations, but along corridors such as Colfax, Federal, um, you just think about those larger um, transit transportation corridors in our city. We're also going to be expanding um, this work next year to look at opportunities for encour encouraging more affordable housing citywide and evaluate how the linkage fee relates to this work. So um, just a couple other points as we um, have begun requiring an equity analysis for the large projects that need a rezoning. So um, this is the large development, um, uh, large development um, review, LDRs, uh, and which, so it begins opening up that conversation between the city uh, and the developer, and then hopefully that translate into the community meetings with um, the community. Uh, and then we also use development agreements to achieve um, the voluntary affordable housing agreements um, that, uh, you know, the neighborhood or the, excuse me, the developer works uh, and presents to city council. Yeah, that's, that's great, great insight. And, and thank you, thank you all for uh, really, uh, you know, amazing uh, insight and, 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 and information on each of your, your topics. I, at this point, um, we are going to uh, uh, open it up to uh, uh, questions from, from the audience. Uh, we're we're going to, uh, if you could, if you have a question and you'd like to, to speak to that question, uh, we have the ability to uh, unmute you and, and um, uh, let your, your video work. And, uh, and you put the question in the Q&A box and, and I will call on you and then uh, our team will facilitate you, you uh, uh, asking your question. If you don't feel comfortable uh, asking the question that way, you can put it in the chat or the Q&A uh, and, and we can ask the question, uh, just let us know how you prefer uh, to do that. And we do have a, uh, uh, someone who has started the, the questions here. We have a question from Rick Erickson. Um, you can go ahead and unmute and, and, and put your video active. Uh, you have a question regarding tenant improvement projects, I think. All right, Rick, we see you there. If um, our team will unmute you if you haven't already. Hopefully our technology works here seamlessly. I'm confident in our abilities with this Zoom meeting. I think you have to unmute it as well, uh, Rick. <clears throat> and if other folks, while we're working through this minor technical glitch, if you can put your questions in the, uh, uh, in the Q and A, yeah, so I'm getting feedback here that you will need to unmute yourself uh, if you know how to do that in, in the lower left section as you put your cursor over the lower left section of the screen. If you could just hit un, it's either mute or unmute. If you hit unmute, you'll be able to speak. All right, while we're waiting for Rick to figure that out, we are going to shift to um, a question from Ellie Swenson. Hopefully I didn't mispronounce your, bad, your name too badly. So, so Ellie, if you wanna uh, do that while we're working through Rick, if you could unmute yourself. She's saying all good, so maybe she doesn't have a question anymore. All right. I see her unmuted at this point. I don't know if, do you, do you wanna ask a question? Yeah. Hi, can y'all hear me? 
We can. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. I was just saying you pronounced my name perfectly, Scott, so you didn't have to worry about that. <laughs> um, yeah. So I just had a question directly for Irene. There's just a lot of back and forth at the beginning, specifically about zoning changes um, around environmental impacts. And I was wondering how that translated into efforts for equity and accessibility in our neighborhoods. I'm just kind of connecting that zone and conversation into um, our efforts with uh, with the Nest Group. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, Ellie. And um, you know, I think overall you are finding that more of our um, disadvantaged neighborhoods are really being concerned about the impact of the environment and their health. Um, there have been more studies around, for example, asthma incidents and Black children and Hispanic children and hospitalizations, and so. I think um, there's excitement about having their environment cleaned up. And in addition, a lot of um, the older homes that are less well kept up are less well insulated and can be harder to heat and to cool. And so um, I think it's something the community supports actually pretty well. I add on to that. Um, Ellie, one of the things, it's not necessarily a zoning piece, but it would be a regulatory piece, is I think about the urban heat island effect. And if you, we've done some GIS mapping and the neighborhoods that are um, disadvantaged, underrepresented, tend to be those neighborhoods that are five, that range like five to eight degrees warmer than other um, neighborhoods because there is not a tree lawn, there's not trees, there's less parks. Um, and it just kind of all, you know, there's more exposed. They tend to be, uh, some of them, especially on the west side, have a, are, you know, from the 50s. So you've got really wide side streets, really narrow sidewalks, no tree lawns or no trees. Um, and so I think that's one thing that we, I, I'm interested in looking at, uh, it, you know, in the next, in the coming couple of years to add to my list, but um, that it really matters. And if, if we can think about regulatory, just within our regulations about uh, requiring trees and tree lawns, that could, that could go a long way, right? That's great insight, Laura. Thank you uh, for that. I, I'm a true believer in that to help reduce uh, the heat island impact. And it, it's, it's so immediate uh, and so effective. Uh, our next question, uh, John, the car, the, uh, Nakarado, hopefully I, I didn't didn't kill that one either. Um, John, if you want to uh, unmute yourself and uh, you're welcome to put your video on. Just hit the uh, unmute button at the uh, lower left uh, section. That's, That's it's six o'clock. The lights just went off. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I had the same problem. <laughs> yep. It's time to get home. Yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, are we having uh, technical issues with uh, John unmuting? Is there a way that we can do it on our end? I think he, he may have two questions for the group. Um, I know we have a couple others in the queue, but let's give it a moment. It takes a, a few seconds sometimes for the, uh, the process to unmute. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yep. we can. Thank you. Okay, yeah, the first one I had, let me go back to it real quick. Um, um, you mentioned that the electronic system is starting to take place as far as the TCO sign-offs are starting to occur. Is that going to be only for newly issued permits or is there is that process going to change place for existing um, 1Cs and ComCons that exist over longer duration projects where um, we might have that ability to go use that electronic route, or is it, or is it intentionally only for new new issuances? Is there going to be like a, a line in the sand drawn for that? Yeah, so um, we're going to try uh, with new projects first. It, what it requires, John, is is we're going to be creating a new uh, new record. Um, the it's it's called a fair record that we're going to have in our system that it's more internal facing for us to keep track of integrating all of the dotty. CPD and other permits and DFD permits, and, and it, it sort of shows us what sign-offs are required from each agency. Uh, so that, that new record will only happen with new logs. I will say though that after um, uh, several months of this, and once we get more used to using that new digital process, 
uh, it would be my desire to try and help these projects, uh, especially with, with the COVID issues that, you know, and having less face-to-face -face contact and getting signatures and cards signed and all that. Uh, we would like to move that way, but I, I won't know that uh, until we've gone through and, and, and actually tried uh, several projects uh, moving forward. So uh, I would like to say definitely yes, uh, but I, I will let you know that is that is something we are going to try and, and hopefully we're successful. Okay. Um, the other one I had, well, I had uh, two more real quick. The, the second one was, is there anything being done so that we have better visibility on the Excel side? On the contractor side, it seems like internally there's there's a lot better visibility in terms of the permit structure and and all the different tiering the child the you know the sub tiers and all that um parent relationships within um the inspector side and the reviewers side we're wondering if it does really shift to an electronic process is there any sort of different view that's being developed so we can really start to see a lot of those progress sign offs that are occurring with the inspectors it's it's a little bit cumbersome to see exactly where kind of some of the permits are sitting um, as they're going through the process in progress sign off all the way up until we call for a final. I just didn't know if there's something that's going to change with the cell so that we have a little bit more visibility as far as, as managing and helping to manage that process over the course of our projects. Um, so similar to what we see when we go sit down with a, a permit reviewer or an inspector where they have that, they have a little bit different viewpoint. Um, than what we do on the on the contractor side on the public side of it. Yeah, so um, that we're as we go through like updates when we get a cell update, um, sometimes you get a new GUI and, and that changes the look of the uh, of the cell. And we're not we're not a um, cell is not real intuitive and it's not uh, one of the simpler programs, unfortunately. So it's a little bit more complicated, and we know that and we apologize for that. I wish there was something more we could do for that. Uh, I will work with our TS team uh, and get back to you. I do not believe there's going to be an outward facing change as we do this digital. Um, it's more of a process improvement from our team, uh, but I can find out when the next upgrade uh, will happen in terms of uh, the Acela upgrade, which might change the look and the usability from uh, the customer side. So I will get back to you on that, uh, John, and, and, and I think uh, Laura and Amanda could push that out in our next newsletter. Uh, and so that, that we can keep folks uh, up to date on that. We, we realize that Acela is not the most user-friendly intuitive system and, and um, we apologize for that. No, yeah, no worries. We were just wondering if it does really switch to electronic, if there's anything you know, to be done, but thanks Scott for that. For that. Um, the last one I did have, and I'll, let, I'll, I'll go quick so that everyone else can go that has questions. The, the question that we had is um, every time we go submit to the building department uh, for permit, it opens a corresponding SUDP. It, it, it happens every single time um, we get a, a building department review is that there's a lot of times there's a lot of SUDPs that are open that are just kind of NA. They're not applicable to the project. They're, you know, you don't really need that record for every single submission. It seemed like it was something that, that changed over the last couple of years. And we're wondering if there's, if there's more, if that really is going to fall in line with the intake reviewers and, and to understand if it really does truly need an SUDP, um, when you get to a project that has three to 400 different records that are open on it, it's a, it's a tremendous amount of closure that has to take place with wastewater um, for a lot of things that don't necessarily need to be open for whether it be TI or whether it be superstructure where everything's above grade. And, and really, we, we go try to close all those um, with wastewater across the duration of the job as much as we possibly can. But ultimately, some of those SUDPs they result in only a, you know, a couple permits that we have to satisfy in the end. But every time that a permit is submitted for review or a drawing set is submitted for review, um, it's opening up that corresponding SUDP. I know you guys are probably aware of that, but I just didn't know if there's anything that's going to change in terms of that process because it was, it was probably one of the bigger um, tasks over the last couple months for us at McGregor Square in terms of getting all those records just completely cleaned up before, before we really start to pursue final sign-offs. Yeah, your, your questions are spot on. I have to say, John, you're, you're, you're right on target. And we, we did that process to help uh, uh, facilitate a more seamless entry in the door because most projects do have the SUDP review and it just happens simultaneous. And have, instead of having to submit to one and submit to the other and have these two bifurcated processes, this sort of brought it together. Uh, and, and the other aspect though is that, that SUDP that the partner within Dottie requested 
that they do get the CL projects to ensure that there, there isn't a component that maybe a customer would realize there's an SUDP review required. And, and that's why they've asked to, to see all projects. Uh, I think we need to do better. I think your point is very well taken. We need to do better on cleaning up those records. When they say not applicable, if a record is open, we need to have them close that when they do that, whether it's an automated thing that happens when they sell it or whether uh, we do that, uh, the reviewer does it uh, when that happens until we can make it an automated process. I think that's a great point. And, and we do agree there are too many open records that happen when you're trying to get your TCO, it makes it challenging. So uh, thank you for that point. And we are making notes on this and we will try to make those uh, improvements uh, that you're bringing up. So thank you very much for that insight, John. Great questions. Awesome, thank you, Scott. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd like to move to the next question. Uh, and, and I wanted to let everyone know that um, Irene had a, she had a conflict, she had another meeting she had to attend. Um, so she had to sign off, but we have other folks that can answer questions. Uh, uh, that might be related to that. And I know L Laura has a lot of expertise as well that can, can fill in some gaps. So the next questions f for uh, Gosia Kung, and I'm sure I, I did not pronounce that correctly. It's, it's very close, Scott, it's Gosia. Gosia. Thank, thank you, thank you for the webinar. And thank you for letting me ask the question. I, the question I have is more policy related and it's more zoning code related. I know we're discussing building code, but a lot of emissions are related to mobility and I know Denver has mobility goals of um, kind of reducing single vehicle occupancy driving by year 2030 to 50%. So my question is related to uh, parking requirements and is there any citywide conversation about eliminating parking minimums and actually implementing parking maximums? And I know that there are some specific areas like downtown or Rhino where um, some of these kind of programs have been piloted. But the reason I ask this question is that we're seeing a lot of private agreements with RNOs through design reviews where there's really excessive parking requirements uh, um, kind of requested or required and, and it both contributes to heat islands and increased driving as well as there has, has equity and affordability implications. So um, just wanted to ask about the parking uh, component in this conversations about both sustainability and equity. I think Laura, Laura could probably address that uh, best in the best way. Grace, you wanna start? I was just gonna to start to say that I was on a panel last week about mobility and sustainable transportation and I could talk all day about land use and transportation and development impacts and, and all of that. So your question was really about, you know, kind of specific to the um, zoning portion of parking management. And so I'll let Laura address that one, but, and I, I should preface by saying too that we, you know, this, this webinar was about, is really focused on buildings and in, in terms of um, my portion, of course, on emissions and, and what we're doing about emissions from buildings. So it's, we don't mean to omit transportation from the, from the conversation of the city's uh, greenhouse gas emissions inventory, about six, almost 65% of the emissions are from buildings, but almost all the rest, like 30, uh, 32% is from transportation. So it's an important issue. Uh, we're definitely working on that in, you know, outside of the building sector. But Laura, why don't you go ahead and address it from the zoning perspective? Yeah, so it's a great question, right? And uh, in the in projects um, that I've worked on from the from the private sector, one of the first things you have to solve for is parking, right? That drives your program oftentimes, sadly, right? Um, and so when you when you get uh, on the inside, when you're thinking about regulating it, um, we we certainly are um, would would love to have the ability, you know, uh, you know, use our tools to um, relax any kind of minimums. Um, and um, I think there is conversation, you know, that we're starting to have about um, maximums and. Um, as well as you know, in denser areas, uh, do we? Uh, how can we discourage ground floor or first, you know, above grade parking? But you know, really start to encourage it. If you need to have, if you really have to have it uh, below grade. Um, so uh, you know, it's an ongoing conversation, Gosha. We don't have um, 
we don't have a silver bullet for that. We, you know, as you know, um, development is the, the, you know, the building is a compendium of the lending, you know, community, the developer, the architect, the planner, the, the governance structure, right? Um, I, I think it's interesting. I had not heard that developers are having side agreements, you know, whether they call them community benefits or, or privately negotiated benefits to um, in, increase uh, their parking. Um, and that, that's a little um, disheartening to hear because I, that doesn't help us grow towards um, a more equitable city or more inclusive or um, certainly not a more uh, sustainable city. So, um, you know, I think it's, I don't have a straight up answer for you other than agree, we need to work to um, push those uh, maximums to, to provide maximums. Uh, and then reduce those maximums to the, to the extent possible um, so that we are, so we don't have parking structures or parking driving uh, the, the places that we live and work and play, right? It, it affects the public realm as well. So good question. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really good stuff. Um, I, I think the next question we have is from uh, Christopher Spelk. Uh, if we can get him queued up for, um, uh, very good. And I think he's, if you could unmute, I think it went from unmuted to mute. If you click one more time, possibly, there we go. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes, we can. Um, well, I did get Grace to respond back on um, just looking at the cost implications of this new green building code requirements and, and obviously on my work with Denver Housing Authority, we're looking at this and hope to be a pilot project. And so it's always this give and take of, you know, building more affordable units and meeting, you know, a net zero or a very more restrictive green building code requirement outside of what like CHAPA requires, which is uh, meeting our enterprise green change criteria. And so there's always give and takes and so I just I guess more of the comment to um, have the city to, to look at that as you know you're looking at both you know these challenges of more affordable housing units and you know the priority to meet these energy efficiency goals and, and especially a lot of coordination with Denver Water as well I think that water is such a key issue and you know, Denver Housing Authority's worked um, in the water efficiency program to re reduce tap fees, for example, it's been a really great tool. And um, so looking at ways that, you know, best practices and, um, and streamlining you know, some of that work, because for DHA, we've really seen a lot of savings and um, probably some of the best return on investments, if you will, for like aerators and even just some of our retrofits for, for water efficiency programs. So, I guess more of a comment than, than a question, but thank you, Grace, for um, letting me know. I'll look out for that study and hope to be a part of it. Well, I, I, I think there could be an answer from Grace on this, and, and maybe uh, it's more, if I, if I understand correctly, it's like, how do we balance um, the two priorities, right? How do we balance sustainability and, how do, and, and, and affordability, and, 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 and how do we move the needle on, on sustainability without greatly impacting uh, uh, affordability, right? So that I, I, and Grace, I, maybe you can share some insights and, and uh, thoughts on, on that. Well, sure, and just in case everybody didn't see the Q&A, so Christopher had asked about um, cost studies. And I'm uh, pleased to let everybody know that we do have a cost study included in our net, net zero energy implementation plan. We expect that we'll actually be live on our website in another week or two. And if for any reason, you know, the holidays get in the way, you can count on it being there in January. Um, so we do have cost studies of that. Also with the Denver Green Code, that was analyzed by the U.S. Green Building Council, which determined that the foundation level of compliance with the Denver Green Code is equivalent to LEED certified, which generally is considered to be fairly standard construction um, these days. And so actually it has been for quite a while. I mean, most city standards are at least silver here in Denver, we hold ourselves to a gold requirement. 
So I don't want to be dismissive of the costs because I do understand that there are costs. And the, the conundrum that we always get stuck in is there's the construction costs and then there's the operational costs. And there's really never a connection between the two. And that is where we tend to see the greatest savings and the greatest benefit to constructing a net zero energy building, a healthy building is during its operational phase. And so we, you know, that's, we understand that that is a hurdle that we need to get over. And I think that's why we are, we've included this cost study. Um, we're also going to have um, studies of that type included in our strategic um, electrification implementation plan as well. So we take that, that issue seriously and we wanna be able to work with developers and builders on being able to answer that um, in their own plans and also for their clients. Thank you very much for that, uh, Grace. I, I, I do think that's, that's always a, a, a very, um, as we're going through the co-development process, uh, we're, we're trying to get both sides, both the development and contractor point of view and, and the advocates for change. Uh, and that's, that's really um, uh, first and foremost in a lot of the conversations as we're making code changes. So I, I, I do want uh, the audience to know that, that we are cognizant of that as we move code revisions uh, and amendments forward. Um, uh, we, we certainly uh, are mindful because that is a priority for us. Affordability is, is a very important priority for us. And, and I think Grace raised a really great point. Uh, I think sustainability and affordability can be, can be together. And, and the benefits happen when, I mean, you're doing net zero or very high energy efficient buildings, and now it's an affordable unit. That, that cost uh, for that person in that unit is much lower. And it's a, that percentage of their, of their, their, their uh, net income, is, it's a bigger proportion. It has a much bigger, deeper effect for that person in that unit. So I do think they're intertwined and they can work together um, personally. Uh, the next question I think is for Sarah Wilson. Um, if, uh, is, does she wanna ask the question or are we just gonna uh, uh, bring it forward? Great. Here's Sarah. It looks like she's unmuted. Go ahead, Sarah. Oh, if you could hit unmute one more time. Thank you. Uh, we're not we're not hearing you yet. Sarah, are you there? We'll give it a moment. Sometimes it takes a second. I'm not the most patient person, so this is hard for me. <laughs> All right, it seems like we might be having some technical difficulty. I think the question um, that Sarah might have had was, uh, it, it may have been part of the presentation, are there, uh, are there gonna be different review times, I believe, shorter review times for signed permits and some of the more low hanging fruit from a zoning review perspective? And we did uh, touch base on that a little bit in the presentation. Uh, we're looking at uh, sign permits, possibly fence, uh, other sort of uh, change of use. Uh, some of those simpler reviews in the zoning review process, we're looking at converting that in January to a three-day review. Uh, we're optimistic it will be early in January that we move that forward. Uh, so those are some improvements within the, the commercial zoning team and the and zoning administration team that we're, we're looking at uh, rolling out in early January. Hopefully I answered your question, Sarah. Um, we can try this again if I missed it. Uh, and I'll move to the next uh, question. I think the next person is uh, Peter Hines. So Peter, if you could unmute yourself uh, on the lower left corner. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, just wanna quick say the e-permit portal is fantastic. I'm really liking getting to know that and, and I'm glad you guys did that. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we do a lot of repurposing of existing buildings and what we find in trying to comply with uh, green codes and, and sort of the newer code work is, you know, we end up looking from the toilet backwards to the sewer pipe. So my question is, is as we get into the IECC and getting into repurposing of existing buildings, are there going to be incentives, whether they're in you know, soft cost dollars or grants um, outside of the permit reduction fee that you had talked about, Scott. Um, you know, are there gonna be some other things available to us that are, are really looking at the existing stock that you have and how we can reuse that stock 
maybe change the use, maybe upgrade it, whatever it may be. Uh, but are there any, is there anything on the table that we're looking at that we can start planning for? Uh, I'm going to open that up to uh, Grace if she has thoughts on, um, I, I know with uh, uh, the new sales tax or some revenue, I don't know if there are any thoughts uh, towards incentives that you, I'm, you've. I'm sorry, I was in the Q&A. Can you repeat the question for me, Scott? Can you summarize? Certainly, sure. So I think the question is a, a lot of the projects are adaptive reuse and they're existing buildings and trying to build uh, those projects to be more uh, sustainable and, and the codes are changing to be more robust for those projects. And I think the question was, uh, are there opportunities that you're looking at moving forward uh, for incentives possibly that, that again furthers that idea of a lot of times we look at uh, redeveloping existing buildings, that's a very sustainable approach. And is there, a, 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 is there a, an incentive program that you're considering moving forward uh, to help incentivize uh, you know, adaptive reuses, those kind of projects uh, for development teams? Yeah, excellent question. And I heard you bring up 2A, so um, yes, the voters approved 2A, which is the Climate Protection Fund. And our first order of business is to actually develop objective evaluation criteria that we can use to determine what types of projects can and should be funded um, with these dollars. And so I think that you can count on seeing incentive programs coming out from us in the building space. What I can't do is give you specifics right now. So it might sound surprising that the passage of 2A actually came up on us pretty fast. It was, you know, with this particular year and this particular economy, it just wasn't clear that it was going to pass or not clear enough that we should be spending, you know, a lot of time uh, working on concrete plans. Um, but this actually gives me a great opportunity to note for everybody, hopefully you can see the chat. I put into there a link to our website. We are recruiting for the Sustainability Advisory Council. This is an existing uh, board and commission of the city and county of Denver. And we are going to be using it as our primary conduit for consistent ongoing communication with the people who we serve. And um, you, those of us who are familiar with our work and like Scott mentioned earlier with the, um, with the task force process that helped to develop the green building ordinance, we do have task specific or subject specific task forces from time to time, but we're really looking for the sustainability advisory council to be consistent and not necessarily task specific. And um, it's a great opportunity for people to get involved in our work and really help influence us as we work to develop, um, again, those objective uh, criteria for evaluating programs and just how, you know, the general steerage of that fund and making sure that we meet the six allowable uses that were in the ballot language and that we're also meeting the other requirement, which is that 50% of the fund needs to be spent on projects that directly impact frontline communities. And that's really important. And I've been told by more than one person that that's more of a floor than a ceiling. So um, these are really heavy criteria. We really need to find the right balance between projects that have deep environmental climate change impacts and those that really direct, directly impact uh, people's lives and improve their everyday existence. So I invite you to, to consider joining us. And again, that link's in the chat. That sounds like a great opportunity for those folks that are, that are interested in being actively involved. Um, thank you for that. And uh, it's a great, uh, great problem to have that you were thrust into this uh, extra funding for your goals. Uh, we have uh, time for about one or two more questions. I think next up, uh, maybe David Weiss. We'll let uh, a minute uh, for David to, uh, there he is. Uh, okay, if you can unmute David on the lower left. Um, yes, right. thanks very much. My first question is pretty mundane, but um, we've just run into issues with getting a receipt for permit fees that we've paid. It would be so handy if the e-permit site would email a receipt once we pay a uh, permit fee. They're what? not. <laughs> Pardon me. You want a receipt? That's a big. Well, sorry, but, you know, <laughs> file up on credit card records. There, there is no address or login number or project reference related to those fees. There's also no such collection point. On the, I mean, you could go to each individual project and scroll through what you did uh, over the previous weeks and try to track down what went where. 
It's just a question. Um, no, it's a very valid question. We should. And, and, and we're at, at a tiny scale. I can imagine some of these operations, you know, would be faced with a much more significant issue. And if you miss something like that, it's expensive to everyone involved. No, it's a, it's a great question. Um, don't make mean big light of it. We, it's something that I think we should have already been doing. And I'm surprised that it's not an automated, simple thing to do to just print a receipt for what you've paid for. And uh, that's, we will talk to you, David, on um, if it's there and maybe uh, there's, we're, we're not making it as seamless as it could be to, uh, to do that. So look out for an email and uh, that will be an update in our next newsletter for sure. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. And you said you had another question. Was there a second part to your question? Oh, I put in three very different questions. <laughs> the next was about microgrids, and this is very pie in the sky, nothing that I'm technically capable of discussing. But um, I follow the events in Puerto Rico pretty closely and the hurricanes and so on. Anyway, these microgrids are, are a wonderful topic, and in an urban area, they're, they're a little trickier to uh, characterize. But the thought is that if a mega development's coming into an area like where my office is located in uptown. And if it were set up to sponsor a, for example, again, this is very idealistic, a, uh, a microgrid for that area, it'd be a way to bring a benefit to all the other smaller, older buildings and long-term residents who are otherwise pretty adversely affected by these eight-story buildings. Um, just a thought, uh, we've looked at it on a small scale where a new building powers an existing historic building so they don't have to provide, tear apart the walls and bring everything up to code. Uh, again, just planting a seed. But if these new buildings, which typically are pretty unwelcome in older neighborhoods, the eight story buildings, if they brought some tangible benefit like that, where they were contributing to a power supply for the entire micro area, a, a block or two, um, it's just a way to, 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 to create real integration and real economic benefit for the people who are bearing the burden of this new, uh, previously, uh, you know, prior to certain ordinances, some of these things weren't allowed, now they're allowed. So it's a change and it's a response to the change. Just, just a question. No, it's an interesting topic. I think it's a very interesting topic in, in how far do we push and where do we push and Grace or Laura, who would like to, to respond to, to that one? Well, I'll uh, just mention a project in Denver uh, that uh, it has a microgrid, which is out at 61st and Pena on the way to the, you know, the, the transit-oriented development site on the way to the airport. Um, and uh, Panasonic is there, Full and Wider is the developer, uh, landowner. And um, they actually uh, were in receipt of a grant with NREL to look at how, right, the existing microgrid, if you go out there today, the existing microgrid really serves uh, Panasonic, uh, but has capacity to serve more. Um, NREL did a study that looked, I think, it, uh, I think like maybe a 40 acre area, um, possibly more that about how to do that. And then how your energy needs fluctuate throughout the day. Um, and it's a fascinating, they have like a 3D room that you walk into that you can kind of like walk into the site. It's all like wow. just, uh, yeah, it's it's or, uh, it's more like um, uh, photoshopped up, right? Uh, and so you can test NREL can test different energy use levels, whether it's in the morning um, or if it's in the morning in the winter time versus morning in the um, afternoon. So I think there's a lot of thinking, you know. And we sometimes we forget that NREL is um, right next door is like part of our city. Well, that's right. City, but but you know that might be a place for us to start that conversation and see if there's um, ways to think about it. I mean that's kind of a edge, uh, urban edge, suburban uh, context. But um, certainly in uptown, certainly talking about a much more urban. Yeah. Context. And it would be interesting, right? The density um, density I think here could be a friend to us, right? If you're uh, in exchange for that eight stories, you're also contributing back to. Um, back to the energy grid uh, in, a, in a prescribed area. So yeah, it's a, avenues it's actual for us integration. to, sorry? It's an actual integration. Yeah. You know, yeah. not just an idea. Wonderful. So that's just right. a story, you know, just, I think there's people trying to do it um, here. Um, I think it's, you know, nothing's easy, but that's okay. That's, of course. that's our job's fun, right?
I, I was not familiar with that. I really appreciate the information. Sure. Great. Thank you very much for that, Laura and um, and Dave, for your questions. I think there were two parts sure. to that question, so I'm going to say that that and was the last question because uh, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I think we said we were going to go till 6:30, and it's 6:31. Uh, we do have some uh, on the uh, slide that just uh, has uh, uh, some contact information. If you want to reach out to to us, uh, you, you're welcome to do so. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for participating in this uh, event today. I, I know I, I thought it was a great format. Hopefully uh, you can maybe give us a little response in the chat if you like the format, uh, this new format. If you felt it was a productive uh, presentation uh, and useful for you. Uh, that would be great feedback for us to get. Um, so thank you again uh, for coming and participating with us today. Thank you, Laura and, and Grace and, um, and, I, and Irene for, for participating uh, in, in this open dialogue. I think it was fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Have a yes, good night. Thanks. Great conversation. Wish everybody a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Be safe.